Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spark Rentals weekly podcast on Facebook Live. Um, <laughs> if you are joining us, or please let us know in the chat where you're coming from and what are some because that's what we're going to go over today. Um, I jumped ahead of myself because I just want to remind you last week we talked about renting to family or friends. Um, we got some interesting um, comments on that. Um, again, there's a definite for or against there. Um, and today we are going to go over landlord tax deductions and let you know what are these things that you should be keeping track of so that you're maximizing your deductions. So you're lowering your tax amount you have to pay. And in doing so, raising your returns, so, right? I mean, the, you know, the, the more you can lower your, your expenses, such as your taxes, the higher your returns. Absolutely, absolutely. So in speaking of these things, um, Brian, start us off and tell us a little bit of some of the typical tax deductions. Sure. So, you know, there are there are dozens of these and we're not going to go through every single one today, but we will go through some of the most common ones, um, starting with everyone's favorite mortgage interest. <laughs> um, so and before we even actually jump into this, I just want to point out that these tax deductions for landlords, these are what they call above the line deductions. So you do not have to itemize your personal deductions in order to take advantage of these. These come off of your rental income. So your, this all happens on a separate schedule on your tax return. And then the, the bottom line, your net rental income after all of these deductions is what appears on your personal tax return. So you do not have to itemize your deductions. And we're going to probably repeat that like three times <laughs> throughout this broadcast because it's, it's, um, so, and that is unlike with homeowners trying to take the, the mortgage interest deduction, landlords do not have to itemize. So uh, landlords can itemize mortgage interest every year. And of course, in the year that they take out a loan, they can also deduct mortgage fees, lender fees at the settlement table, points, uh, junk fees, like admin fee, processing fee, that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff. Right. So uh, all that's deductible. Um, you can also deduct for depreciation, which is something that gets very confusing very quickly for a lot of real estate investors. And many landlords actually don't even understand depreciation. So we, we have a whole article on it that includes a free depreciation calculator. I'm going to put a link here in the comments to that. Um, by the way, Trent Thompson says, hey, all. Uh, Trent, hey. Hey, Trent. <laughs> So depreciation, here's how this works in a nutshell. When you buy a rental property, there are two things of value that come with that, right? You've got the land and you have the building itself, the, the improvements on that land. Now land does not decline in value over time, right? It doesn't rust or crumble or fall apart, but the building does. So the IRS lets you do a process called depreciation for the building portion of the, the property. Um, and when you buy a property there's, on the tax assessment, it'll, it'll be a land assessment and a building assessment. So the, the building's value, you can deduct, you can spread that deduction for the entire building value out over the first 27 and a half years that you own the property. So for each year after that, that first year, you take one twenty seventh and a half <laughs> of that building value, uh, and that's you can. It was bad enough that. they had to say twenty seven, but they had to throw <laughs> a right. half in there to really confuse it. <laughs> Seriously, I don't, I don't, who, who knows where they, where did they even come up with twenty seven and a half? <laughs> but so you can. That's how depreciation works. The the value of the building when you buy it, you can you can deduct that but you have to spread the deduction over the next 27 and a half years. Now added to that are many of the closing costs that you incurred at the settlement table when you bought the property, those get added to your cost basis and you can depreciate those as well. Um, and if you make any what are called capital improvements, uh, improvements that extend the life of the building, for example, putting on a new roof, that also gets added to your, your cost basis and you can add that to your the depreciable amount each year as well. So right. all of that, you can each year you can deduct one twenty seventh and a half <laughs> of of the building value, most of the closing costs, uh, any capital improvements that you make. 
So, uh, and again, we put a link in the comments there to anyone that wants to see the, to read up on depreciation, see exactly how it works and use a free depreciation calculator. <laughs> All right, speaking of capital improvements and repairs, um, you, you can um, deduct for maintenance and some repairs. Um, the difference between repairs, maintenance versus capital improvements are that repairs and maintenance are not things that extend the life of the building. And now that gets to be a blurry line very quickly, but uh, to give you a, a quick example, if little Timmy from next door throws a baseball through the, the window and breaks it, and you replace that window, that's a repair. You can deduct that cost. If you go out and replace all of the windows in the property with like super high energy efficiency, double paned windows, that's a capital improvement. So a quick example of <laughs> maintenance and repairs on the one side, which are deductible versus capital improvements that have to be depreciated over 27 and a half years. All right, moving on. Property taxes, also deductible because otherwise you have to pay taxes twice. You have to pay taxes on your tax bill, which is, <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah. Um, same thing for landlord insurance. You can deduct the cost, your premium for landlord insurance as well. You can also deduct the premium for rent default insurance, which Denny and I talk about quite a bit. Um, rent which default insurance. gives more reason to have something like that. Yes, and it's not expensive. It's a few hundred bucks a year. And if your tenant stops paying the rent, the insurance kicks in and pays it for you, which is awesome. <laughs> helps you sleep at night as a landlord. Absolutely. All right, uh, legal and professional fees. For example, property management fees, realtor fees, accounting fees, like accountant fees, bookkeepers fees. Uh, all of those are deductible for landlords. Mm -hmm. um, travel expenses are deductible for landlords, but that's one that a lot of people get in trouble with because it's a bit of an audit trigger. Uh, if you try to claim too much in travel deductions, that's a good way for the IRS to flag your return and come after you with an audit and say, well, let's see all of your receipts and yeah. your records to prove that you were actually traveling for real estate investing and for your rental properties. So you gotta be really careful. And they want about. logs. They don't want just, you know, well, it takes, it was 15 miles from here to there. So I just wrote that down like that. They want dates to, from mileage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And another one that is also an audit trigger is meals. But you can, it is legal. Landlords and real estate investors can deduct for meal costs uh, while they're traveling to visit properties that they already own. And that's a really important distinction. You can't write off meals when you're traveling to scout for prospective rental properties. Uh, the IRS will not let you do that. And Again, if you get too crazy with the, the meal deductions, the meal cost deductions, expect a, uh, a not so friendly letter from the IRS. <laughs> yes, <laughs> if you're going to McDonald's on your way home from your rental property, which is two miles from your house, that could be a problem. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Um, and then you know, a third one that is also, it can be an IRS uh, audit trigger, but it is a legitimate uh, deduction for landlords and real estate investors is a home office which, you know, as of the, the, the tax law changed from a couple years ago, the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, which we'll talk about more in a minute, uh, just as a very quick overview, but um, that, uh, that no longer allows W-2 employees to claim the home office deduction, but self-employed people can still claim the home office deduction and real estate investors and landlords are self-employed. So you can take the home office deduction, uh, but again, you gotta be really careful with it. You know, don't, don't try to pull one over on the IRS here. Um, the room that you claim as a home office, it cannot be used for anything other than work. You cannot have a spare bed in there used for like guests when they come and stay with you. you can't have any of that. Home office must be only used for work. Uh, and again, only available to self-employed people, uh, but my mother's real estate investors do come to self-employed people. Right, it's dedicated space. Dedicated space, exactly. Uh, and of course, you can also deduct for the costs of people who work for you. So whether that's mm -hmm. employees, whether that's contractors, uh, anyone you pay uh, to help you with your, your real estate investments or with your, your rental properties, that person, uh, the cost you, you pay that person is deductible. So things like a virtual assistant, if you have a virtual assistant help you, uh, those costs are deductible as well. 
and, and a cleaning person for your office if you truly have somebody that does that. Right. Or, you know, if you manage like vacation rentals, you have some Airbnb properties and you send in a cleaning crew in between guests staying there, you know, those costs are deductible as well as another example. Denny, did I miss any deductions that you want to include here? I think we got them. All right. So there, there are many of us. Um, and we, we actually have a, a very... It's really important. It's important. We got to put the disclaimer here. We are not accountants, nor am I a financial professional. You know, that's just not what we are. So it's important if you have several properties or, you know, just just please talk to a financial professional, an accountant, and a good accountant who knows real estate. Absolutely. Um, I've gotten messed up by using an accountant who didn't know yeah, real not estate. Not all accountants are created equal. So. <laughs> Um, we no. included a link in the comments <laughs> to our very comprehensive guide to landlord tax deductions for rental properties. Um, it's, you know, we don't have time to go through all of them today, um, but check out that list if you have any questions about landlord tax deductions. And I want to, let's, let's do a very quick run through, Denny, of some of the most recent tax changes that have gone into effect within the last few years. Um, just as a, a quick overview for anyone who, uh, who's been under a rock for the last couple of years uh, with their tax returns. Um, just, you know, some quick, there, there are still seven tax rates from 10 to 37%, but the income, yes, the income tax ranges did shift a bit. Um, our standard deductions rose from 200 to 400, so it now, it makes it now twelve four for twelve thousand. I can't talk today. Twelve thousand four hundred for single and twenty four eight for married um, and eighteen six fifty for a head of household. So those are a little different. Um, the same deduction went way higher a few years ago, um, which is both a good and a bad thing. Um, but they're basically they're discouraging people from um, itemizing their deductions, which for the average person is probably a good thing. Uh, keeps your tax return a lot simpler, right. uh, and it makes the IRS's job simpler. Right. Um, yeah. So the standard deduction is now much higher: twelve thousand four hundred for single people, twenty-four thousand eight hundred for married couples filing jointly. Uh, so yeah, much higher. Um, a nice thing that just happened, I think, this year is charitable. When you're itemizing, charitable donations um, are now a hundred percent of your adjusted gross. They can meet that, um, and you'll still get that whole amount to itemize hundred percent and the meta itemize, yes yes absolutely yeah. they they won't work if you're doing the standard um as well as medical costs um have gone up to seven and a half percent um may also be deducted which is an increase well right so your medical costs have to be at least seven and a half percent of your adjusted gross income right for, in mm -hmm. order for you to uh, deduct those. Now, if you're self-employed, you you can deduct your medical expenses as a uh, as a business expense, right? I don't know if it's considered a business expense, but it is. Oh well, it is a business expense if you have like an LLC and your LLC is paying right. those. Yes, but if you're paying for it personally, it's a little different. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Once again. We're not CPAs. <laughs> so, exactly. You know, this, this and you know what? You there are, this is changing like daily. Like I um, I have a friend of mine that's an accountant and she just, I mean, we're, we're in March and she just had to take a class on how to handle some of these new changes. So it's changing constantly. Um, like for instance, like the, the um, this stimulus check that's coming out, if you file your tax return last year and it was less, you know what, then they're going to go by that. But if you already filed your 2020 and it's more, they're going to go by that. So if you want more money or any of the money, you got to be careful with all that stuff. And this just was released. So, I mean, this, you have to really keep your eye on things. So. Yeah. And that's a great point. Um, Denny, are there, are there any other 
COVID or pandemic related uh, tax issues that, that landlords and real estate investors in particular should be aware of? Well, I mean, there's quite a few people that have losses, rental losses, because of the eviction moratorium and, and yeah. unemployment rates. Yeah. So um, they, they are considered passive. And I didn't even realize this. There's a five year, this is like the 27 and a, and a half. <laughs> but it's a five-year um, carryback privilege. So you can stretch that loss out if it doesn't meet the maximum, if it overstays the max, over goes the maximum. So that is so good. Carry, carry the loss Carry forward. it forward. Of course, you, yeah. yeah, I can't to talk your, today. your income next year. Exactly, yeah. which is good because, you know, the years that you <laughs> maybe hopefully don't in the future have losses is going forward. Um, cause there's a lot of people that got hit hard with this. No question. No question. And any other COVID related tips, uh, tax, tax tips for landlords? I think anything, um, don't forget to include anything that you had to do to make common areas COVID friendly, um, or protected, anything like that. A lot of people won't even think about put, you know, installing those sanitized stations as anything. And, it, and they are. So make sure you keep track of all those things as well. And keep an eye on, talk to your accountant and keep an eye on what's going on out there. Because I have a feeling things are going to change because of the moratoriums and they're um, stretching them. And there's got to be some relief for the, the landlords that are, there. there's landlords that are hurting big time because of this. Well, you know, it, it, landlords are unfortunately not a very politically powerful or protected group. I mean, they're, they're much maligned. Um, uh, but at least we have some good tax deductions. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Uh, so as a quick run through of what we talked about is common tax deductions for real estate investors and landlords. So mortgage interest and fees, depreciation, uh, maintenance and repairs, property taxes, landlord insurance, rent default insurance legal and professional fees such as property management fees or accounting fees or realtor fees, uh, travel that's specifically for your real estate investments, uh, meals while you're traveling for real estate investing, your home office, uh, and of course any employees or contractors that, uh, that have done work for you this year. Any, uh, any last thoughts any before we call this episode complete? I don't think so. I think uh, that covers it. Just again, make sure that you're keeping your eye on the uh, the news and good resources. Don't <laughs> there's so much out there you don't even know what's true and what's not. But and then check with a good financial person because that's important. Absolutely. Well, thanks, you guys. We will see you next Tuesday. Because it's super complicated. Yeah. So we'll see you next Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And let us know what you want us to talk about. This is, this is just as much about you guys as it is about us. So let us know your, your requests, your thoughts, any questions that you have about real estate investing, landlording, and we will see you next Tuesday. Have a great day.